Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen to a new edition of the Daily Debate. In tonight's show we're going to be looking at a new phase of the Decent Life Initiative, the Rural Transformation for Egypt's countryside. And uh, we're going to be looking at some of the budget allocations and some of the developments and progress taking place within this presidential initiative. But before we start doing that, let's check out a couple of the stories making the news today. We'll start off with uh, Prime Minister Mustafa Madbouli, who stressed on the coordination with specialized authorities, especially the General Investment Authority, to discuss new investment projects and follow up on the implementation of projects in the civil aviation sector in accordance with existing plans and strategies. This came during a meeting held by Prime Minister Madbouli to review the procedures for using the investment zone at Sharm el Sheikh Airport. The meeting was attended by Minister of Civil Aviation. Madbouli began the meeting by displaying the exerted efforts to support civil aviation sector according to the directives of the state regarding increasing investments in the vital sectors as well as using many new investments opportunities on the level of all civil aviation sectors which contribute to providing an attractive economic environment that will attract more investment. Minister of Aviation displayed a project to use an area in Sharm el Sheikh Airport to establish an entertainment city. During his meeting with Minister of Tourism, Madbouli stressed on the importance of continuing to intensify efforts in the current phase to encourage the tourism sector, adding that Egypt has a great and various touristic potentials. And Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri said uh, the only way to end the suffering in Gaza is uh, sealing a ceasefire deal. He was speaking at a press conference in Cairo with the visiting German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock in Cairo on Tuesday. He said any attempt to resettle the Palestinians to neighboring countries is unacceptable. He said the dire circumstances witnessed by the people of Gaza and attempts to resettle them elsewhere counter all international laws. He said Cairo backs efforts to allow humanitarian aid into Gaza. For her part, Berbach said the suffering of Palestinians in Gaza cannot continue and concrete measures are needed now to ensure aid gets to the people there. She loaded Cairo's role in the release of hostages and negotiating a ceasefire agreement. She said Germany supports all efforts to end the war in Gaza and to prevent a spill over the conflict. These were a couple of the stories making the news today, but now focusing our attention on the Decent Life Initiative. Let's check out this report regarding the new phase for 2024-2025, and we'll be right back. Decent Life Initiative is an unprecedented radical transformation of Egyptian countryside by targeting the provision of the needs of Egyptian villages for infrastructure and public services and creating ways to improve income and provide a decent standard living for rural communities. This initiative is also considered an ideal model that reflects combined efforts of all ministries to contribute each within its scope. Minister of Planning and Economic Development, Halal Said, said Egypt is poised to begin the second stage of Decent Life Initiative comprising series of countryside-focused national infrastructure projects in the coming fiscal year 2024-2025. Minister Said emphasized the importance of securing substantial resources to finance these projects during the next fiscal year starting July 2024. Regarding the investment plan for fiscal year 2024-2025, she emphasized the need to prioritize investment in human capital and allocate public funds to the health and education sectors. The second stage of the initiative is planned to cover 1,670 villages countrywide and provide services for some 
20 million citizens. Their investments in the presidential program are expected to reach more than 1 trillion Egyptian pounds. The first stage of their initiative serves 28 million citizens in 1,477 villages. It is expected to be concluded by the 31st of December this year. Initially planned to be completed by the 30th of June 2022, the program was delayed by shortage of raw materials and equipment from abroad owing to current global economic circumstances. Decent Life Initiative, introduced by President Afet Sisi in January 2019, aims to elevate the quality of life for the most vulnerable segments of Egyptian society, with a particular focus on enhancing daily services in rural areas. The coverage of this initiative expands to include 4,584 villages, 28,000 residents at the level of 175 centers in 20 governorates of the Republic. The Decent Life Initiative, as a humanitarian initiative, contributes to achieving goals of the National Human Rights Strategy, whether related to basic service rights, economic, social, cultural rights, or the rights of women, children, people of determination and youth, as its development programs and projects cover all activities and areas of life and improve living conditions. President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi launched the initiative Decent Life in collaboration with the Ministry of Social Solidarity in March 2019. مصادر الحياة كريمة هي محاولة مننا إن إحنا نعالج مسائل مزمنة في مناطق هي الأكثر فقرا على الإطلاق في بلدنا مصر ونغيرها تماما. The initiative covers 32 million people. The first phase includes 377 villages in 11 different governorates. It provides pure drinking water lines, ceiling, roofless buildings and houses, and donating blankets and furniture to at least 3 million people. It helps construct 15 schools in the villages, expand job opportunities to establish small businesses. The second phase targets the villages where poverty rates lie between 50 to 75%. Villages with 50% poverty or less will be targeted in the third phase. The Ministry of Social Solidarity provides 80% of the initiative's cost, while the remaining 20% will come from NGOs. The Egyptian citizen today is on top of the state's priorities. وانني اس اعلن اليوم انطلاق هذا المشروع الطموح تنميه الريف المصري حياه كريمه في وقت الشده قادره تحضنوا الى ده وتعيد المشاهد بعلم الوصول احنا بخدمه اهلنا ولاد مستعينا على تنفيذه بالله وبثقة في قدرات المصريين دولة وشعبا فإنني أعتبره تدشينا للجمهورية الجديدة مصر دايما لما تنوي قادرة تعمل معجزات في التاريخ دور تلاقي عنها مكتوب حكاية
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And joining us here tonight in the studio is Dr. Naveen Makram Labib, the Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Director of the Social and Cultural Planning Center at the Institute <laughs> of National Planning of Egypt. Dr. Labib, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Labib, first off, now the President mentioned, uh, I mean, speaking about the budget for 2024 2025, now there is allocation obviously for the Decent Life Initiative. It's entering a new phase now. We understand the, the inflation happening and taking place all around the world and the cost of such uh, a mega huge investment uh, and initiative here uh, is always multiplying by the day. So a lot of money will be needed to uh, finance such uh, an initiative. So how how are we prioritizing the financial allocation for such, such an initiative? How, how is the financing going to happen? Are we including different stakeholders? Uh, is there uh, a percentage on how, how much the private sector will be investing or the civil society organizations or the government, of course? Okay, let's first of all say that the president today said that we should focus on healthcare and education, in addition mm -hmm. definitely to the social services. Yes. So these are the top priorities for us in the country. And again in the, decent the initiative, life. the mm -hmm. Decent Life Initiative. Because to be able to provide a decent life and a better life for people, you should educate them and they should be healthy. Mm -hmm. So you should provide educational and healthcare services. But in order to uh, do it in each and every governorate that will be covered with this uh, initiative, we should go for a needs assessment. Mm -hmm. So we usually start by kind of a survey or a study in order to know the priorities of each governorate. And then we can allocate the mm -hmm. funds based on the priorities, based on the needs. And here we'll take into consideration the citizens' uh, initiatives and the citizen opinion as well. Mm -hmm. Because with the citizen, we need the, the knowledge the local knowledge, yes. we call it local knowledge because we get to know more about their needs, their expectations, mm -hmm. uh, because they're the ones who will say that they have a better and a decent life mm -hmm. by the end of the initiative, hopefully. So we'll have the, to conduct, first of all, the needs assessment and then to allocate the funds and to start working on the infrastructure, whether we're talking about uh, the traditional infrastructure or mm -hmm. the IT infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Because definitely we'll be, we'll be making use of digital technologies. Yes. And then we should focus on humans, mm -hmm. the human capital, how we can develop the workforce. And definitely we should have some uh, assessment ways mm -hmm. in order to be able to monitor and evaluate by the end of the initiative. Yes. So I guess that <coughs> can be a plan and these can be some steps to follow in order to be able to allocate the funds in a proper and suitable way for each governorate. Yes. Well, if we are talking about monitoring and evaluating the initiative as a whole and the process, so there needs to be some sort of a committee to evaluate what's taking place and uh, really maintain the sustainability of such an initiative. So it's not something that we start <laughs> for... The, that's going well, let's say, for the first five or ten years, and then it goes down the drain. So what sort of monitoring or what sort of a committee would be responsible for following it up? And do we also take into consideration the citizens' uh, evaluation of what's taking place on the ground? Definitely. Mm -hmm. We will be knowing if it was successful or not, or let's say the rate of success by asking the citizens. And that's one of the key pillars in this initiative. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we have a committee that is shared by the Prime Minister in order to be able to monitor. And we'll be monitoring, this will be a regular um, way of doing things, mm -hmm. not monitoring <coughs> and evaluation by the end of the initiative. Mm -hmm. So as to know the pitfalls and the challenges and to be able to face the challenges and to solve the problems. Yes. Dr. Labib, now, <coughs> when you spoke <coughs> about the needs of each governorate, does that mean that there will be some sort of uh, an independent plan for each governorate tailored for the, the needs of each governorate or the, the potential? I mean, if one governorate is 
well known for uh, agriculture. It's different from another government rate that's uh, well known for um, an industrial uh, capability. <laughs> so do we have certain individual tailored custom made, let's say, plan for each and every single government rate? I think that when we started the initiative, we were focusing on the traditional uh, needs, mm -hmm. such as uh, building uh, schools, for example. But uh, at this stage, maybe we should have some tailored plans, mm -hmm. because as you just mentioned, that each governorate rate has its nature, has its uh, demographic uh, factors, environmental factors, and so on. So again, to be able to provide a better and a decent life, we need to tackle uh, these factors. Mm -hmm. We cannot have just one plan that fits all. Mm -hmm. There are some changes. I'm yes, thinking. well, you've been going <coughs> around different governor rates and you've first-hand experienced some of the Decent Life Initiative's uh, progress. Now, are, priori are priorities changing uh, as opposed to when we first started this initiative? We had certain priorities. Did they change? Are there certain challenges or obstacles that um, surfaced now we need to have a plan B or a way around some of these challenges? Um, I believe that yes, mm -hmm. we faced some challenges, but the point here is that the expectations have been changing. Mm -hmm. So it's not only the needs or the challenges, but now I think that people have higher expectations. And that's why I believe that we should make use of technology mm -hmm. and of innovation so as to have some innovative solutions to what we're facing. I mean, when we started, we wanted just to provide some healthcare services, the traditional ones. But now we're talking about different things. We're talking about providing telemedicine, for example, mm -hmm. especially for the underserved areas. So that could be one of the innovative solutions, not only building hospitals, although this is very important, but we should, again, think about AI, think about artificial intelligence, yes. and making use of the digital transformation and the AI in this field. Mm -hmm. Well, how far has AI <laughs> been uh, really not just developed, but also implemented and accepted by the citizens in the countryside to also take it a step further into telemedicine? Uh, citizens now used to artificial intelligence? Are the, the, the med medical personnel used to uh, dealing <coughs> with artificial intelligence as part of their daily medical routine, for instance? For the healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. yes. They definitely know a lot about artificial intelligence and they're making use of it already. But the citizens, not really. Some of them are still scared. Mm -hmm of dealing with any uh, intelligent machine or any intelligent uh, equipment, as we say. And others are welcoming the idea. So it all depends on the education level. But in all cases, we can provide them with better services. I mean, if we provide the telemedicine, then I think that they will accept it because they need some uh, professionals in some of the governorates, in some of the areas, and that is not available there. Mm -hmm. So this can be, again, an innovative solution. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems that a lot of these villages are already struggling in having a wireless internet connection. So we're talking about a step further in having artificial intelligence and asking the citizens to accept it with open arms. How is that feasible? It should be feasible if you have the requirements. Mm -hmm. And as you just mentioned, the first requirement is the IT infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So if you have IT infrastructure, if you have talented people who can develop customized IT solutions, then you will have a better chance to implement artificial intelligence in this, these governorates. Or else this will not be possible. Because whenever they say that we could not do, uh, we could not implement AI in a certain domain, when you revise, then you find out that the requirements were not met. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Labib, you've mentioned <coughs> the importance of obviously having the infrastructure and raising the awareness in terms of uh, information technology and AI for the citizens as well. And maybe the nature of uh, many of these villages, it, I mean, they go through very unscripted sort of daily life routines. 
So the priority of having some sort of a disaster management aspect for such uh, an initiative, because everything is still relatively new, how are we prioritizing or how much are we prioritizing disaster management in these areas? I think right now we're more focusing on the healthcare and the education and mm -hmm. providing social services and providing maybe some customized government services as well. <clears throat> but disaster management is very important. Mm -hmm. And it will not be a problem because the people who will be working in this area will be talented and well-educated people who will develop or make use of the currently available systems in order to be able to deal with the, with the disasters so that mm -hmm. will not be a problem. The, the real challenge that we're facing is educating people, educating citizens, mm -hmm. or at least bringing some awareness to them so that they know what artificial intelligence, or at least what technology is. Now we're talking about, again, education and yes. training and providing better uh, jobs for them, mm -hmm. better job opportunities. Yes. Well, education and health, uh, they've always been high on the agenda for the development of the Egyptian life in general, not just the Decent Life Initiative. And with the president actually namely uh, mentioned the health and education sector. Now, in these areas, the country and the initiative is working on building the schools and establishing schools and convincing or getting people around really committing, sending the students and the children to the schools. <laughs> so, how are we actually going to apply artificial intelligence to the, the educational system in these rural areas, even though we're still, I mean, we're talking about building the infrastructure, the actual building and the classrooms and convincing the students to go to the schools. So is it too much even to, to ask or dream about applying artificial intelligence and getting the students who already have problems or a challenge to actually motivate them to go to schools to accept and <laughs> apply artificial intelligence, let alone the, the, the teachers? Actually, we can make use of artificial intelligence in order to be able to motivate the students mm -hmm. and engage them in classrooms. So here we're talking about different applications of artificial intelligence because uh, people think that artificial intelligence is all about robotics. Mm -hmm. We were not talking about robotics definitely in these rural uh, governorates. We're mm -hmm. talking about uh, a simple way of doing things. We're talking about gathering more data about the students, about the teachers, about the courses, about the local market, about the environmental factors and demographics of uh, the specific, mm -hmm. each specific uh, governorate, and then applying a model in order to be able to predict the needs and to analyze these needs and then having some plans to meet the needs. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can make use of AI in a different way, mm -hmm. an analytics perspective, as we say. Yes, and that comes into the tailor-made sort of projects or tailor-made education, depending on the governorates and the, the nature of the villages or uh, the potentials that can actually be of use for the students. So they would actually graduate and not really have a problem finding a job within their local area. Exactly, mm -hmm. because we're talking here about unemployment. So if we have special uh, or specific programs for these students and then specific training programs, not only educational programs, and enabling these students and the fresh graduates for the market in this specific governorate again, mm -hmm. maybe they will have a better chance to have a decent job and then they will have a decent life. Mm -hmm. Do, does, I mean, does the vocational training come mm -hmm in parallel, go, goes in parallel simultaneously with the educational, academic sort of life uh, within these rural areas? Definitely we need both. Mm -hmm. Maybe we started with the education, the, the traditional programs, but now we need to change our mindset. Mm -hmm. We need to perceive things in a different way and see the needs of the governorates. That's why one of the main uh, strengths of uh, this specific initiative mm -hmm. is that they take the opinions of citizens into consideration. So then you will get to know more about them or else you will be providing better services from your perspective, mm -hmm. not from the citizen's perspective. Mm -hmm. 
and that's where the citizens' uh, participation or the citizens' suggestions and evaluation of the initiative actually comes in, in hand. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, Ministry of Planning is c collaborating on the financial inclusion for the Decent Life Initiative. Let's check out this report and we'll be right back. of Planning and Economic Development and the Central Bank of Egypt, CBE, have outlined the execution of the financial inclusion strategy for the second phase of Decent Life, a national project aimed at uplifting the Egyptian countryside. The Assistant Minister of Planning and General Supervisor of Decent Life, alongside the CBE's Director General of the Financial Inclusion Department, reviewed the progress made in the initiative's first phase. This phase saw the installation of 1,208 ATMs and the establishment of 127 bank branches by September 2023, enhancing access to diverse financial services like electronic wallets, internet banking, prepaid cards and QR codes. They emphasized the pivotal role of financial inclusion in achieving sustainable development goals within rural Egypt. This included the disbursement of medium, small and micro loans totaling 26.3 billion Egyptian pounds and mitigating pollution by reducing transportation needs for financial services. Future steps involve intensive collaboration with the CBE and partner banks to assess and address the financial service needs of villages entering the second phase of decent life. The two sides commended the contribution of CapMass and CBE towards these efforts and highlighted the strategy's goals to enhance villagers' quality of life through improved financial infrastructure, increase awareness of banking services, and support for small and medium-sized enterprises. Meanwhile, Helal Said, Minister of Planning and Economic Development, announced the goals of the Economic and Social Development Plan for the fiscal year 2023-2024 and the second year of the medium-term plan for sustainable development. Minister Said said the plan document comes as a culmination and continuation of the participatory approach followed by the state in the development planning process. She stressed that its directions, objectives and development programs were formulated by constructive national dialogue that brings together all sectors of society to strengthen the bonds of cooperation, coordination and integration between government agencies and the private sector. El Said asserted that 2023-2024 plan estimated the economic growth rate at about 4.1% in the year 2023-2024. She explained that these estimates are similar to estimates issued by the international institutions which indicate that Egypt is expected to achieve a growth rate ranging from 4.4%, 3% in 2023 and 2024, and 2024-2023. The minister further added that it is estimated that the gross domestic product in the year of the plan will reach about 11.84 trillion Egyptian pounds compared to 9.8 trillion Egyptian pounds. The value of the expected output for the previous year 2023-2022 to achieve the desired rate of economic growth. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, continuing our discussion with Dr. Labib. Now, Doctor, you've mentioned the, the implementation of artificial intelligence within the educational system, and it's, it's very optimistic, it's very nice, but there must be some sort of pitfalls or obstacles. Now, what sort of pitfalls do we have in applying artificial intelligence with the data being collected or used for uh, for the educational system as one sector within these rural areas are we talking about um, security are we talking about exposing things I mean because these the 
the data is a matter of national security. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can call them challenges mm -hmm. to be again more optimistic. Yes. So uh, the data privacy, the confidentiality, because in order to be able to apply the set of analytics and to be able to predict the needs of uh, the citizens in the governorates, we might be facing some challenges related to data. The data collection, the data validation, mm -hmm. are these data good or noisy? As we always say, that that's a main challenge for us, for mm -hmm. any, any of the professionals working in AI or IT even field. Mm -hmm. So we need to focus on collecting data using uh, different ways, various ways, and then validate it before relying on these data and being sure that these data are secure mm -hmm. because we're talking here about national security. And as we always say, there is not 100% secure system. It does not exist. Mm -hmm. There might be some mm -hmm. problems, let's say, or challenges yes. regarding the making it private and making it confidential. Mm -hmm. And uh, another point is the biases. Mm -hmm. Are these data biased or not? Because some people think that whenever we collect data or apply artificial intelligence, that these systems are not biased. Sometimes they are, they are biased due to the sample that was collected and due to data that was not validated in a proper way. So that's another problem. Mm -hmm. So we need to consider the challenges, not only the requirements. We start by meeting the requirements and making things ready for the digital technologies to be applied so as to benefit out of them. And then we should consider that we'll be having some challenges to face and finding a plan B for it. Mm -hmm. Well, if there is a system <coughs> bias, does that mean that the system can favor a certain cluster um, over others? So the citizens getting some of the benefits from the application of AI within any sector, be it the education or health sector, does that mean that <coughs> there could be some favoring within the application of AI within these systems? Yes depending on the data that was fed into the system. Mm -hmm. And this is very common, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's not something exceptional. I mean, this is usually the case. That's why we need to revise the data that was collected before relying on it. Mm -hmm. Especially when we're talking about a presidential initiative that is aiming at providing a better and decent life for people. So we should consider who really deserves mm -hmm. each uh, educational or healthcare or social service before mm -hmm. providing the service. And does that revision, I mean, who, who actually takes care of this revision? Is it the IT department, for instance, within the Decent Life Initiative, or are we talking about the committee that is following up and evaluating the progression of the Decent Life Initiative that the Prime Minister is part of? We're talking about a team of experts, mm -hmm. those who work in this field and some of the IT and analytics uh, professionals, mm -hmm. because that's a joint work. They should provide us with their expertise and we should work on new AI models that can maybe have better outcomes, better results. Dr. Labib, you've mentioned the uh, mm -hmm. social services provided within the, the Decent Life Initiative and the governmental services. Now, this is something, I mean, we are in the age of digitalization here in Egypt and still in the big cities and in the capital, citizens are still getting their heads around making use of the social and governmental services and the employees within these governmental institutions as well. So how how are citizens within the rural areas under the umbrella of the Decent Life Initiative making use of social services and governmental services? You know, they provided there some social services mm -hmm. in an electronic way, but they need guidance. So there they will find more guidance than in Cairo, for example. You'll find people who are trying to um, kind of explain to them how to make use of the system or else making use of the system, I mean, using their passwords or whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean helping them to make use of the system. Like what we sometimes see here whenever we deal with the, the ATMs. Yes. But there you will have uh, people from the government, mm -hmm. I mean some uh, government uh, officers who mm -hmm. are helping the citizens because they're not that well educated. But we need more to work on the awareness. Maybe mm -hmm. having some awareness campaigns and trying uh, to have 
maybe some programs, some TV programs, who are kind of explaining how to use these systems in a very simple way. Mm -hmm. Or maybe we as IT professionals should provide uh, easier systems mm -hmm. for them. Well, all of these things need money. The, the, um, it needs serious financing. Uh, the President, yes, did mention that a big sum will be allocated for the Decent Life Initiative, but with everything, ev prices are doubling by the day, and definitely the expenses and the finances of such a huge initiative is multiplied already hundreds of millions of pounds over the past <laughs> few years. So how are we f really securing a sustainable financing mechanism for such an initiative? Are we talking about a multi-stakeholder operation? Are we talking about, uh, yes, government, private sector, civil society organizations? Are we also maybe looking for uh, foreign investments within the, the Decent Life Initiative? Or is this an exclusive, Egyptianly exclusive sort of financing mm -hmm. mechanism? Actually, we have the business sector already. Mm -hmm. So we have different stakeholders regarding this initiative. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that we have um, a real problem regarding the financing. Mm -hmm. That's why you should focus on having priorities. Yes. So it's not about having funds. It's about allocating these funds so as to have better priorities regarding, again, education. Another point is to be able to develop our own technologies because we have talented youth who can do it. Mm -hmm. And they are very well educated, by the way. Yes. Nowadays, they're working remotely for other countries. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of number one source for developers. So we can make them develop the systems here in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And this will be better cost for us, lower costs. Yes. So we have different, again, innovative solutions that can help us to face any crisis regarding the financing. Yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, talking about the Decent Life Initiative, we're entering a new phase for the new fiscal year 2024-2025. <laughs> and as Dr. Labib mentioned, it's all about planning, prioritizing, and the proper allocations of funding, developing our own technologies uh, by ourselves. So these are the main pillars of how to make such an initiative a success for the foreseeable future. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this edition of the Daily Debate. But before we go, I'd like to thank my distinguished guest, Dr. Naveen Makram Labib, the Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Director of the Social and Cultural Planning Center at the Institute of National Planning of Egypt. Dr. Labib, always a pleasure having you with us. Thank you very much. Thank pleasure you very much. Mind. Thank always you. a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, please stay <laughs> tuned for more coming up on Nile International. I'm Henny Safe. Thank you for joining us.